the stakeholders are opposed to it. Tonight, we get a president, flag bearer of the NDC, John Jermani Mahama, has disclosed he is opposed to the LGBT plus bill, if the issues surrounding it, and also in support of the bill. Pardon, and this is a personal position or indeed a reflection of the NDC's official position. Plus, what is the current state of this anti-LGBTQ plus bill? We will be getting an understanding from one of the sponsors of the bill in addition to John Mahama's declaration of being against LGBTQ activities in this country. Also, consumers must brace themselves to pay more for fuel at the pumps beginning tomorrow, February 1, as prices are set to go up. Yeah, we hear from the Institute for Energy Security on this matter here on Ghana tonight. And a number of things are going to start from February 1. Apart from this uh, emissions levy, that will require that if you drive or you operate a public transport, brace yourselves for between 150 cities, 300 Ghana cities. We'll tell you a bit more about that. Plus, these fuel prices, all things being equal, may go up unless government intervenes. We'll touch base with all of that. Also, we have an exclusive interview with the Right Honourable Andrew Michel, who is a UK Minister of State for Development and Africa. He's going to be speaking to me about corruption in Ghana and how the UK is also helping Ghana fight corruption. This is on the back of the Corruption Perception Index that we spent some time talking about last night here on Ghana Tonight. As always, you're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and X. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Breeze. More than 7,000 public sector workers could lay down their tools after the deadline by labor groups to have government withdraw its planned 15% value-added tax on electricity expires today. Organized Labor has scheduled a meeting tomorrow, February 1, to decide on their next line of action. It was a collective decision, and Organized Labor will meet to actually look at the issue, the, the message that you just read to us, then a decision will be made. The Electricity Company of Ghana will tomorrow begin another revenue generation drive. The energy distribution company has increasingly come under criticism for failing to collect enough from the power generated contributing to the growing debt within Ghana's energy space. Already, debts to the IPPs as at July of 2023 stands at some 1.7 billion, a figure expects within this sector attribute to falling revenues by the ECG. ECG says its latest revenue drive, dubbed No Free Consumption, will see its official spread across the country until February 16 to, among many things, collect arrears and disconnects for non payment. <music> Mother of slain soldier Maxo Mahama says she is yet to come to terms with the gruesome killing of her son despite the seeming justice in the sentencing of 12 convicts to life imprisonment. In a meeting with the Attorney General following the judgment against the convict, Madame Veronica Bamford asserted that no government should grant the convict's payroll to serve as a deterrent. A rotten hell. May they never come out. And any government that would ever come into power that would give any of them, par what do they call it, parole or whatever, that government would have my son's blood on their hands. <laughs> Flag of the National Democratic Congress is urging Parliament and the government to iron out the financial bootlegs that the passing of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill will impose on the public press. Private members' bill in its nomenclature must not impose any financial burden on the taxpayer. Well, me personally, and I, I, a man is a man, a woman is a woman. I believe it's a nipa, what me, a sorry, I say, um, I am an Assemblies of God member, and my faith is against men marrying men or women marrying women. I mean, nature created as man and woman. And Nyame Boyano, he knew what he was doing when he created us like that. And so if you ask me, my personal faith is against it. 
The Public Accounts Committee has taxed the Ghana Education Service to devise means to hold the numerous cases of an end salary by its officers and teachers. The service had to respond to multiple queries on that subject at Wednesday's Public Accounts Committee hearing. What he did is highly criminal. It is double salary on end salary and illegally validating yourself. It's, those 72,900 has been the highest ever on end salary any individual for all these years has received. This morning is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, we have a conversation on the issues of corruption because the right honourable Doc, uh, that's Andrew Michel, UK Minister of State for Development and Africa, has been speaking to me exclusively about corruption in Ghana and then also what is going to be done in terms of collaboration uh, with the UK in helping Ghana put systems and structures in place to fight corruption. I sat with him earlier today to speak about this, plus how to ensure that the taxes that are collected and what it is used for is evident enough, the transparency in the uses of taxes so that we can all attest to the impact of taxes in this country. He talks about dirty money that from, from Ghana may find its way in the UK and how the UK is also helping the Ghanaian government trace dirty money. That's corrupt money. Take a look. Um, corruption perception index, for instance, that indicates that Ghana hasn't done too well in improving the systems and structures to fight corruption in this country. Does that concern you as well? Well, we, we always should have, both countries, a zero tolerance of corruption policy. And one of the things I was talking about this morning with ministers was how we work together to try and make sure that when money is stolen from Ghana in one form or another, uh, we try and make sure it comes back. It's a priority for Britain under this white paper which we have published and which has been uh, endorsed uh, by the president of uh, Ghana, uh, who's spoken very warmly about it. It focuses on how the partnership which exists between Britain and many countries in the uh, world, but none more so than Ghana, to drive forward the bid to reach the SDGs by 2030 to increase the amount of money for climate finance, another thing we were discussing this morning. Um, this white paper endorsed by Ghana is a blueprint, if you like, for how we advance those causes, which we both care very deeply about. So let's get a bit more detail into this, um, the details of this white paper that you talk about that, for instance, money that's stolen from Ghana sent to the UK will be flagged. How, 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 how is that going to work? So, so the white paper is uh, much wider than that. The central part of it is how we ensure that the international financial system turns the billions of dollars that are acquired for climate change and climate finance, right. tackling climate change, how do we turn that from billions into trillions? But one of the aspects which the white paper deals with is dirty money, stolen funds. Where, where Britain, under Prime Minister Cameron, who is now the Foreign Minister for Britain, uh, one of the key things uh, he did as Prime Minister was to try and uh, tackle global corruption and the flows of illegally taken money. And so, so when you raise with me the issue of corruption, I want to point out that the close relationship between our two countries extends into all areas, but in particular, if money is stolen uh, from uh, Ghana as a result of corruption, uh, Britain will be a faithful supporter of Ghana to try and get it back. One of the uh, points that uh, happen, I'm afraid, is that something like 40% of all the stolen funds, the dirty money around the world, tends to go through London or British overseas territories. So Britain has a dog in the front of this, and we want to help Ghana if Ghana uh, has uh, difficulties in that respect as well. Beyond that, what are some of the other structures in internal um, support um, that you're giving to institutions in this country? Well, well, well one, one of the things we do is there's a very close cooperation between the Inland Revenue 
Her Majesty's, uh, His Majesty's Customs and Excise, where well, there's a close program working together to maximise tax in a civilised and decent way. And of course, uh, through that partnership, which is long lasting, through the work too that is done with the Bank of England, uh, we are able to maximise the amount of tax that is raised in a fair way, because it's very important that investors uh, know that they will be treated fairly. And, of course, that tax money goes to support the education of children, the basic health services upon which our citizens uh, rely, whether they're in Ghana or in Britain. So, in, in essence, you're asking for more evidence for what that taxes are used for. So you can point to, for instance, in the UK that when taxes are taken, citizens know exactly where it is going. That has to be evident as well in, in this country. Well, that, that, that is one of the effects of the work we do together. And transparency and openness is always at the heart of all these things, whether you're dealing with uh, taxation or other sources of finance. Being open uh, and transparent about it is a key ingredient of building up uh, a state which serves its citizens. Well, it ends on the note about the transparency and how taxes are used so that when you're asked to pay taxes, you understand exactly why you're being asked to do so. And then when you're paying the taxes, you get the evidence of what the taxes are used for. That statement leads us to the next issue here on Ghana tonight because the Ghana Revenue Authority has announced the implementation of the emission levy. That's another form of a tax which kickstart tomorrow, February 1. But those at the receiving end and other stakeholders are opposing it. Up next here on Ghana Tonight, we, we get a proper understanding of the levy and all that concerns this particular levy that is supposed to kick in, begin February 1. That is tomorrow, the emissions levy. Now, the cost of owning a car is about to go up a notch higher. And then also the process of renewing, for instance, your road worthy for your vehicle. But government says that this is about protecting the environment rather than as a revenue generation measure. So beginning tomorrow, a new emissions levy will come to effect that will compel an annual payment of between 75 CDs to 300 Ghana CDs in line with government's efforts at tackling greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the GRA has already served notice in the national newspapers for this matter. My colleague, Dennis Poiberi Wadam, um, is here with me because we've been studying the, the release by the Ghana Revenue Authority to understand exactly how this is going to play out beginning tomorrow. Dennis, wh what did we find in this GRA statement? So the GRA is basically giving an announcement, serving notice to the public that effective tomorrow, they would start the implementation of what is now known as the Emissions Levy Act 2023 at 1112. For many, um, there were some discussions hoping that this would be deferred to a later date or mm -hmm. there would be further stakeholder engagement to see if this could pass. But unfortunately, um, for those people, unfortunately for the GRE, mm -hmm. this will kick start tomorrow. So what you see on the screen is what the GRE has published in the dailies. Which is, mm. which is like, today. Emi yes, they publish this today. It's taking effect tomorrow. That's to say, notice to everybody, we are hitting the ground running tomorrow. So that's what you see there. GRA informing the public that effective tomorrow, they will implement this act. This they say is in line with government efforts to tackle greenhouse emissions and to promote the use of eco-friendly. So th this, this levy was approved in parliament last year. Yes. So the announcement comes with the, the, the rates. But we'll go into that, talking mm. about when it was approved and all the discussions that underpin the passage of this particular law. Super. But straight forward to it, some of the rates that have been put up there, we have gleaned them and put them out nicely on graphics so that we can have a pictorial um, view of how it looks like. Mm -hmm. So they put, so essentially, this levy is going to be imposed on owners of vehicles that use. Um, fuel. Now we are talking about combustible engines. Okay. So we're talking about vehicles that use petrol, diesel, and the like. Mm. So for motorcycles and tricycles, they, 
owners of such would pay 75 cities per annum. So any, any that's motorbikes and Motor, any other? Yes, motorcycles and tricycles. Tricycles. So two legs, three legs, motors. That's the Mahama That's Kandu, how we can put it in the, in the lane. And Boboyas and yes. the one. Yes, oh, they will I be see. paying 75 cities per annum. For motor vehicles, buses and coaches up to 3,000 cc. Now cc is simply cubic centimeters. In other words, it's the measure of how much um, fuel that is pumped through your engine. So in, 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 in our everyday parlance, you hear somebody say, my car is, the, capacity, the engine capacity is 1.0, 2.0, yes. 3.0. That's right. So 3,000 cc will be equivalent to 3.0 okay. engine capacity cars. So, so you're for, saying that if, if someone has a vehicle with a, a 1.5 uh, engine capacity or 2.0, yes. how much are they going to be paying? So up to 3.0, you pay 150 CDs. 150 CDs. For, uh, per annum. For those who have vehicles and buses and coaches that go beyond 3. Point, I mean 3,000 CC, which is the 3.0 3, um, engine capacity, they'll be paying 300 CDs. Now for trucks and cargoes, I mean, that's, it matters not whether it is below or above the 3,000 CC you mm -hmm. pay the same 300 cities per annum. But how did we get here? We need to understand why. Good. Because somewhere December 2023, mm -hmm. the majority leader, who of course is leader of government business, put before parliament a bill on behalf of the Minister of Finance. And that bill was to the effect that they needed to introduce this particular levy in order for them to promote what they say was an eco-friendly technologies and greenhouse improvements. Right. And that's how this whole thing started. The purpose yes. for this, at the core of it, is to have a friendly environment and to tackle air and water pollution. Because in the estimation, there was a lot of carbon dioxide in the air and they needed to deal with it head on. Mind you, this has been a global conversation. Mm -hmm. Anytime we go for the COP conferences, I mean, these are some of the things that come up very strongly. True. Fair to say that we know that in Africa, we are the least of the countries that uh, emit these gases into the air. Absolutely. Most of them are from the Western world, but <laughs> we have to find a way of dealing with it. That's a conversation. So that's a fundamental thing. concern that, in fact, and that you underscore there. So if we are the least contributors to emissions, question is, why are we being taxed? for being the least contributors, which means that this is the least of our problems that we should be, 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 be concerned about, right? That's one of the derivations and the issues that people have concerns with. Yes. Why this, the, but, this tax. And of course, Alfred, our president has been lamenting this. He says that it's unfair that Africa would have to pay for something that they contribute the least to it. And the money and is we are that, being taxed for it. Yes. I mean, we need to augment. Of course, there will be some money that will be paid So how much, how much are we talking about? Climate. So... Um, the last time the president spoke about it, he had said they were going to give us 55 million US dollars to 54 countries. In essence, he was talking about 1 million dollars for each country. But then at COP28, mm -hmm. which was held in Dubai, there was a conversation to increase the money. I mean, the African countries were pushing for somewhere between 100 to 400 billion US dollars annually. Like I said, that's, but domestically, there was the need for African countries themselves to also raise revenue to tackle climate change issues. And this, on our part, was one of the things that we were doing. I see. So the projected revenue, as at the time the committee was considering this particular levy, was that they were projecting to make some 451 million US, uh, Ghana cities for the 2024 fiscal year. So from the implementation tomorrow till the end of the year, the expectation is that we will be able to raise some 451 million Ghana cities. And it's supposed to be paid into the consolidated now, fund? Now, this raised, this brought about some issues because mm -hmm. the minority members on the, on the committee raised the concern that it was going to bring untold hardship to the ordinary Ghanaian. It was their view that Ghanaians were already facing some challenges and imposing an extra levy on them would, be, um, would not be good. In fact, at that committee level, they refused to... Um, to recommend then a bill for, for, for its passage. I see. But some way, somehow, it was recommended, it came before the, the, the parliament, and then parliament passed it uh, before the end of the year. Now, and, and how. And let's put it on record as well that the, the minority uh, voted 
against this. So well, it was, by, it was by what majority decision? It was by majority recommendation. Okay. Yes. So in the report, it is contained that so it is expressly it, it, uh, expressed in that report that the minority members did not recommend. So they voted against this. I see. So um, yes, I was talking about how one is required to pay this. Mm -hmm. So now for all those who are supposed to pay this, that's owners of vehicles, you need to register and then you pay on the Ghana.gov platform. Now, why do you need to pay? You need to pay because you would need to show evidence of that payment for you to get a road user certificate. So what like, it means is that if you don't pay, you may have to drive the car on your own road or you may even have to drive it in your room. So, I see. So without it, you're not going to get your roadworthy certificate renewed. Yes, so the, the DDL has been told that any time you come and other testing centers demand for evidence of the payment of this emission levy, so you have no option that to pay. Very important stuff that you put out there, and Dennis. And you know, th this nearly slipped under the radar for many people um, because of the page it was captured in, in, in the newspapers. But thank you for highlighting this. So we know that by tomorrow, these are some of the things that the gifts for the Valentine month, is it not? February. Uh, Darobosu is here, is the Deputy National Director of Arocha Ghana. Daryl is joining us uh, in the studio. That is good to have you. Thank you so much. You were in COP28 yeah. in Dubai with government officials asking for money, <laughs> right? And then we're, we're being taxed for it. So what, what, what are the issues with this emissions levy that, as an environmentalist, you raise concerns about? Okay, um, thank you for having me, Alfred. And um, I think this levy really brings a lot of concerns because if you even follow the international discussion mm -hmm. on climate and also responsibility for addressing emissions out there, the global community recognizes that we in Africa are least responsible. And that is why there are certain principles governing even international action on climate change and climate responsibility. And one of the key of such responsibilities or principles is that we all recognize that we have a common challenge, but we have a differentiated responsibility. Mm. So if you look at the global community and actions looking at um, climate and emissions, you realize that things like taxes and emissions levy and all of that is only applying to developed countries. Okay. Where, these, where they have been at a, level, a certain level of development, emissions are peaked and they are really finding ways to contribute their quota to addressing uh, emissions, which is leading to climate change. So the whole world agrees, and that is why it's been even very difficult for the global community at some of these international um, conferences to mm -hmm. talk about a global um, carbon tax, because right. it is not possible to do that. Mm -hmm. And in respect, in the same vein, our government has been on these international platforms mm -hmm. talking about just climate transition and the need to ensure that even if we have to really pay for something, you need to recognize that some countries are least developed and so should it be responsible. And that has been a very uh, major problem with mm -hmm. this particular levy. The fact that it is not recognizing that we in Ghana here are even least responsible for the emissions that we are talking about. So in the first place, we are talking about climate uh, just transition out there in international global f f forums and all of that. Mm -hmm. But when we come home, we perpetuate an injustice where we're actually taxing our people for something that we're not responsible for. And we think that this is where the law that has been passed is actually flawed. And again, you don't see why you should tax a new car the same as an old car. Mm -hmm. Even if your engine capacity is 3,000 cc. One car That's 3.0. Yes, 3,000 cc. Let's assume the engine capacity. Okay. 3,000 cubic meters. I mean, that's your engine capacity. Mm -hmm. It's a new car. Mm -hmm. You know that for new cars, maintenance regime, use fuel efficiency is all very much better than a very old car. But with this particular levy, there's no difference. It's a flat one. It's a flat So both for old and new cars it, it is that have uh, 3.0. 3 exactly. Uh, so whether you're up to 3,000 cc above and all of that, old and new, you're all attracting the same fee. Now, the other issue you also want to talk about is that why is a tax that the government really says is intended for um, emissions reduction, air quality, pollution, and all of that going to consolidated development fund 
consolidated funds mm -hmm. for government expenditure and projects. Why, why, why do you think there should, they should have been some very dedicated? You know, we've had certain. We don't forget, Alfred. Mm -hmm. We even already have what you call the sanitation and pollution levy, True. which is charged on some petroleum and also diesel. True. Anytime you buy fuel, which is already going to address issues of sanitation. air quality and pollution. So, so you see, actually, that this law is actually replicating already an existing levy which is already dealing with this aspect. So it is interesting. So your, your, your point is that so long as we have the sanitation and pollution levy, that is which one is of the on issues, yes. the every liter of petrol or diesel you buy, you are paying sanitation and pollution levy. I think exactly. it's about um, either I think it's a certain, yes, yes, it's not, to, yes, not yes, up to that. You know, so if there's a sanitation and pollution levy already, yeah. which we've been paying for a number of years now, yeah. You raise questions about what exactly this emissions levy. Yeah. Would well, do. I think the emissions levy the government has explained. Mm -hmm. But what we are also saying is that first of all, the levy is unjust because we are on the international. Uh, we are in the international conference saying that climate transition must be just, mm -hmm. and so don't tax us in Africa because we are least responsible. So why come back home and impose a tax? Now let's understand, Alfred. If you look at the whole global community. Only about 27 developed countries have actually imposed carbon tax directly on their citizens. 27 developed countries. 27. And there are several other carbon trading schemes around the world. Uh, and I think 36. In Africa, it's only South Africa that has got a semblance of a carbon tax that is in operation. But Kenya tried it. I mean, these are all discussions. They tried, but it has not come into effect. Okay. So we really need to understand that there are several other schemes that we can use, and other countries mm. are using that. And we are saying, look, if government really needs to start dealing with emissions from certain sectors of the economy because they think that they are high emitters of, of carbon and all of that, there are other schemes that the government could have used. For instance? One of them has been what we call the cap and trade, where for particular sectors, you set a threshold... Mm for the particular sector instead of as an, an entity within this particular sector, mm -hmm. don't emit beyond this threshold. If right. you do, then we are forced to tax you. But that would have been a more than really setting a blanket tax price for almost every citizen. So the reason every why economy. vehicles are being levied yeah. is because of the emissions. It's because of the emissions. From that that is the, the exhaust yeah. emissions. Yeah. And that when contributes your car burns and, and, and all and of fuel, that. Yes. That contributes to pollution. Exactly. But already there's <laughs> sanitation and pollution already. Uh, yes, levy. some some bits of it on on, on, on petrol, on every liter of petrol and diesel which is that targeted you, exactly. and obviously vehicle also users. With air quality and pollution issues. Yes. True. So and, and the vehicle yeah. users who buy fuel are the people who pay the sanitation exactly. and pollution levy. Exactly. Has that even been accounted for? That is there is there any data on how much has been accrued from the payment of the sanitation and pollution levy over the years? I think, Alfred, I think in, um, I, I recall some uh, years back, there has been this discussion as to what really the sanitation level has been used for. Mm -hmm. And I think this has come up. I don't want to go into those details, but the fact remains Oh, well, if, if they have the evidence of what has been used for, yes, we'll I think see these it. Are because some um, that you really need sanitation to, yes, is a big exactly, problem. It's a big problem, and we used to see that these tags are being used for what they are used for. Now, you bring in another emissions levy, you don't really decide or even indicate what this fund is going to be used for is going into the consolidated funds. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no clear application of this fund to actually climate-related interventions. Ghana is, is, is struggling to really find a lot of financing for mitigation adaptation. You would have expected that if we really want to even impose a tax, it would have been very directed, targeted, to really lead to raising finance. And it's not doing that. It's, mm -hmm. it's first of all, unjust, because an international community we are actually not supposed to be taxed like this. So why are we being taxed? And then when you set it up, there is no transparency mechanism because it's just going to consolidate the funds. Who are you reporting? How it is used for? It's also become, going to become another issue that we really need to look at. Very important point you raised there. And Ken Alfesso Sabuaji, retired, um, is also uh, sending us a message watching us. He says that all this emission tax, it says, is to raise money for spending on other 
things rather than curbing emissions. Mm. He says we should ask when the road maintenance tax on the price of fuel dating more than two or so decades, if not more, was actually used to maintain roads in this country. Important question. But we've been speaking to a number of people on this matter of the emissions tax levy that takes effect tomorrow. Mm. Uh, these are the, the thoughts of the Ghanaian people. Take a look. I think drivers has been burdened with a lot of tax from last year up to this year. And when you look at the parts we are buying from Abasokan, you can see that we are wasting a lot of money to purchase those parts. Everything has been increased. And if the government is trying to bring another tax again, I think it's not going to help drivers. So we are pleading with the government to absorb that tax because the government himself said things are hard. And if things are hard and adding another tax on drivers, so what can we do? Well, to me, I think it's a very bad idea. It should have been good if the government himself is able to afford it. But it's like, if you can't afford for something, why do you fight for it? Are we the cause of the thing? That is the question. Are we the cause of it? So how can somebody like you go and steal something and now bear the consequences? It's not possible. We've been paying taxes, we've been paying roadways and all sort of things. Even the insurance, everything that we will, there's no any benefit that we get from it. Because smoke, especially you see gas. I will come for cars. Obi will have asthma. That's why we say no dear chia. So we need air conditioner. Obi said there in the paper. To have it there. So, Daryl, indeed, uh, quickly in 30 seconds, what's going to be the next in terms of raising the concerns? Because Parliament has approved this uh, the, by majority decision. The majority voted in favor of it. The minority in Parliament voted against it. But the numbers game always came to play and it's been approved. So February 1, what next? Alfred, I think we were quite surprised that this, this bill actually that went to Parliament was actually towards the end of the year. Mm. Quietly, we, we actually have been yeah, wondering, you, you, they push a lot was, of was there a lot of engagement with organized labor, other civil society groups and all that? And we've tried to really find out information. So it means that there was a clear um, opportunity, missing opportunity to really engage on this process. Otherwise, if we had done that, we could have had a better arrangement. And I think that going forward, we need to bring this up in a discussion. That we are luckily in a political year, election year. Let's see how our um, aspiring political, um, what, what do you call it, candidate mm -hmm. would, would want to handle it. But I think government should look at this again. Parliament should look at this again because this is one of the first class cases of unjust climate actions that we can take at the country level. Daraboso, Deputy Director. Uh, National Director of Arocha Ghana, uh, Environmental NGO. Thank you so much for joining it's a us. Pleasure. Thank well, you as apart well. from this uh, emissions levy that takes effect tomorrow, there's something else that's going to happen tomorrow because consumers would have to brace themselves to pay more for fuel. Uh, the pumps beginning tomorrow, February 1, as prices, all things being equal, may have to go up. We're here from the Institute of Energy Security. They've been doing some research and, and projections into this. Uh, Nana Amwesi, the seventh, is the executive director of the Institute for Energy Security. Nana, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, um, looking at the statement that you put out earlier today, that all things being equal, the price of petroleum products as petrol and diesel, LPG, are expected to go up uh, with the first pricing window of February. Get me more into that. What what is contributing to this projected increase? Well, I just got an uh, indication from analysts at IES um, Economic and uh, you know fuel decks. The international price of fuel has gone up. Gasoline has gone up. Gas oil has gone up. Um, and of course, um, LPG prime market. In view of that. It could impact on local market prices. To make the matter worse, the city stability against the U.S. dollar, the greenback, is also called into question. And that's to say that the city is depreciating against the U.S. dollar. And so these two key variables, international price and the value of the city, 
um, make that reasoning um, that price of fuel on the domestic market could go up. So, yeah. of course, that's intervention from government to foresaw that. Yeah, uh, there's projected margin of increase. Between 2 to 3% for both diesel and petrol. 2 to 3%. Two to three percent, if government doesn't intervene. Um, but let's do it in monetary terms, right? This two to three percent, how would they translate? Um, I mean that if you're buying fuel for let's say eleven point five liters per liter, you will be compared to pay something around eleven point nine liters per liter. Eleven point five. That's eleven cities, fifty pesos. That's that's if you're projecting to 11 cities, 90 pesos. That's 40 pesos uh, increase on a liter. So a gallon, if you multiply that 40 pesos uh, by 4.5, then we're talking about something substantial, is it not, Nana? That's something we need to bear with because we're exposed to international market prices. We don't produce. Uh, any substantial amount of fuel in Ghana, and we, we've lost a handle on our own city strength against the US dollar. All right. Thank you. Nanam Wesi, the seventh, is Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Security. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Uh, that's a quick notice there. If there is no intervention, just Petroleum consumers should brace themselves for an increase in fuel prices, all things being equal beginning tomorrow. Coming up next, the former president, flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, has disclosed he is opposed to LGBTQ plus activities. Is this his personal position or a reflection of the NDC's official position? Plus, what's the current status of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill? We go into that conversation on Ghana tonight. Well, earlier today, the former president and flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, has said he does not support the promotion of gay activities in the country because his faith as a Christian who belongs to the Assemblies of God Church is against it. Is urgent parliament and government to iron out the financial matters by the passing of the anti LGBTQ plus bill and how it would also impact on the public's purse. He was speaking at a public forum with the clergy in Koforidia in the Eastern region as part of the Building Ghana tour. Me, Mijidi, my faith is against LGBTQ. I am an Assemblies of God member and my faith is against. Men marrying men or women marrying we women. Say, the faith I have, empenny say, Bema, Bewari Bema, or Ba Bewari Oba. Bill a war parliament. The bill in parliament has not been passed yet. But government has shown that even when passed, the president will not assent to the bill. If he say, the attorney general, can he say, this is because the Attorney General says private members' bill, which bring financial costs to government, should not be signed. So based on that, the President has indicated he won't sign such a bill when passed. So Parliament and the Executive should work together to ensure such provisions, which will have financial implication on government, are dealt with. It puts a charge on government, then it opens the way for the president to be happy to sign the agreement. And so, me personally, and I, I, a man is a man, a woman is a woman. I believe he said, Nipa, what me, a sorry, I can say, I feel you, I'm a me your bar. And so, yeah, I'm a bear mind to me because I said, no, my your bar. I mean, nature created as man and woman. And Nyame Boyano, he knew what he was doing when he created us like that. And so if you ask me, my personal faith is against it. 
Well, so that's John Mahama there. Let's get on to the telephone and adore. Sam Nate George is Member of Parliament for the Ningo Pram Pram constituency and one of the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill in Parliament. He's joining us on the telephone. And what's up, George? Good evening. Thank you for joining us on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Alfred, and good evening to our viewers. Great, thank you. Uh, now, first of all, let's, let's start off with this. What's the status of the bill in Parliament as we speak? Well, before Parliament rules at the end of the third session of the third meeting of the eighth Parliament, we were doing the consideration of the bill. Basically, the consideration is where we vote on the individual portions of the bill and complete the work on the bill. The bill, as it stands, has 25 clauses, or there are about, about 25 clauses, I think. And um, before we had to break to work on the budget and appropriations bill, we have done about 11 of the, of the 25 clauses. There are about 38 amendments or so that have been proposed. Um, in conjunction with the chairman of the committee, between us as sponsors and the chairman of the committee, we had about 38 uh, amendments. And we're done up to class 11 out of 25 before we had to break for budget there. So we are confident and hopeful that when we get back to Parliament for this first, uh, session of the fourth meeting, we'll be able to, we'll be able to get the, the bill completed. And then, because what we have is just a, a little bit of, of work. We should be able to complete that in no time. And I'm sure within two weeks of, of Parliament dedicating time to it, we should be in a good place to, to get it done. Uh, interestingly, this morning I ran into the chairman of the committee in Parliament and I asked him uh, where we stood and said, oh, he was ready when we resumed to continue the consideration. So hopefully, if everything being equal, within two weeks we should be it should be good. I, yes. I hope that we can give it as an Easter gift to Ghanaian people, to the people of Ghana, that by the time we celebrate Easter at the end of, of, of March, the bill will have been passed. So these 27 amendments that are yet to be attended to, you are sure that before Easter celebrations this year, the anti-LGBTQ plus bill will be passed into law? Provided the speaker gives us the room and the business committee label prepares it or sends it over, I'm sure that we, before Easter we should be done. Because once they are done with the remaining amendments, and, and I think that if you look at the bill, we were done with the controversial part of the bill. Um, or, or, or not necessarily controversial, but um, the issues that are really tough. When you talk about what is an offense in the bill, we're done with that. Um, I think that if there's any other thing that may, may be a bit uh, tricky to navigate in the bill uh, that is left, it will be the one that talks about advocacy. Um, that, I think, is in course 13 or so, but 13 or 14, and we're yet to get there. But again, I mean, even being able to deal with the offenses and, and get that out of the way, I'm sure that that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Whatever amendments are brought, it will be debated discuss and we'll pick it up. So I'm confident that within two weeks of speaking, if we apply ourselves to the bill, within two weeks it should be done. Well, Parliament resumes next week, correct? Yeah, next week, Tuesday. Next week, Tuesday. Now, beyond this, I know you don't speak for the flag bearer of the NDC, but he's the leader of the party. In his speech today, he was very clear that, look, I, I don't support this. LGBTQ plus activities, and, and you being one of the vocal persons, and not just a sponsor, but um, speaking for this group of sponsors as well of this bill, does, does this position represent the position of the NDC as a political party? Well, well Alfred, again, with respect, I'm happy you, you have laid the caveat that I, I'm not a spokesperson for the flag bearer of the NDC. Neither am I a spokesperson for the NDC in its official capacity. I believe the General Secretary and the Communications Officer are, are best positioned to speak for the NDC. However, what I would say is that it's never been in any doubt in my mind the position of the Vice President, John Bernardi Mahama. 
In fact, while he was president and I've been communication specialist to him in the presidency, um, I remember in March of 2016 when he visited the Scottish Parliament. There was a protest and a walkout because of his position on, on LGBTQ. He's always been opposed to it. And so some pro LGBTQ MPs faced the walkout in March 2016 uh, in protest against President Muhammad's visit to Scotland. But that has always been a position. Right? I mean, even before President Mahama, President Mill, who was his boss and then president, found the experience to take the position of, of government and, and, and his position. And by, by extension, the NDC at the time, that the NDC did not support uh, homosexuality. Because the NDC is a party that represents the hopes and aspirations of the people of Ghana. And so I'll continue the flag bearer and president are considered to be the leaders of the party when we have a flag bearer and we have a president. And so at this point in time, President Mahama is the leader of the party, and I believe that his position will represent that of the party as well. Um, the NDP in Parliament, our leadership in Parliament works closely with uh, the, the leadership of the party at, at Abapa, and if you look at the support, right from Honorable Hayana Idrisu, all the way through uh, the state elective forces that we have had um, in terms of support as sponsors from the minority corporate, I think it will be safe to assume that the NDC as a political party uh, holds the view that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. And we respect the position of the, Ghanaian, the National House of Chiefs on this matter. And we, we, we also stand with our, our, our clergymen, both Christian and traditional and Islamic, in their belief and their faith that what God has created of the man, we should not consider as any other thing. So I think that, that this, is, this is the first indication yet. And I encourage other political leaders and, and, and opinion leaders to also speak. And without equivocation, they are support for this bill because this bill is not a partisan one. It's not NDP, it's not NPP, it's about Ghana. But the name of the bill is the promotion of Ghanaian family values. It's, it's good to see one leading flag there speak to it and state what its position is. We, we encourage everyone else to also speak up and give support. It makes our work easier as sponsors in Parliament, knowing that we have um, all the leading flag there. Of, 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 our, of the political parties in, in, in Ghana to, to support it. So we welcome President Mahama, our sponsors welcome President Mahama's position on the bill, and we urge every other uh, major political party flag there or independent candidate or whoever it is that intends to be president of this country to state an opinion and express support for, for this bill because it is the only thing that is done yet. I mean, you can't run away from it. Indeed. President before, President before in 2007, um, took a very, very principled stand that I salute him for when, when the, the, the World Council of Gay, Gay Rights wanted to hold their global match in Accra. President before told them that Accra was not open to them, they were not welcome in this country. And, right. and refused to ex extend an uh, 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 open border to them. And so you can see that across both political parties, um, we've seen leaders in the past take a fair position. And, and we hope that that's going to continue. Indeed. I do appreciate your time on this. And we'll follow up in the, uh, how things play out in Parliament. Thank you for staying up to join us. A pleasure, my master. Thank you for what you do for them as well. As always, Sam George is Member of Parliament for the Ningo Pram Pram constituency on the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ plus bill. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, after this quick break, the Labour front appears to be in turmoil as more and more Labour unions continue to declare strikes. What really is going on? Stay with us. We'll give you an update on the Senior Staff Association strike as well after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Economic activities in public universities may likely be disrupted following the joint strike by three workers' unions. We're talking about the latest to lay down its tools is the 
Tertiary Education Workers Union of Ghana. Now, this means those in charge of opening lecture halls and other learning facilities on campus will not report to work beginning tomorrow. There are a number of things happening on February 1. Now, this adds to the list of unions which are on strike already. Now, take a look at this. These are the unions that are already on strike and then the latest to join them as well. The Tertiary Education Workers Union of Ghana, TEWUG, uh, effective tomorrow, they're going. And bear in mind that it, this is a time when a number of the first year students are also preparing to start lectures. Teachers and Education Workers Union, TEWU, effective February 1. And you have Senior Staff Association, they've been on strike since January 17. The Ghana Association of University Administrators also have been on strike, effective just a couple of days ago. And, 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 and so this, this, this is the worry here. Let's do this quickly because uh, Isaac Donko is the national chair of the Senior Staff Association of the Universities, that's the public universities in the country. He's joining us. Thank you for connecting with us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, the National Labor Commission indicated that they had directed you to call off your strike. That's a senior staff. But you're still on strike. Why is that? Thank you for having me, my brother. Yes, uh, we went to National Labor Commission, I think last week, Wednesday, and few issues pop up. One, we are to meet the Ministry of Finance, <coughs> sorry, Ministry of Finance for engagement tomorrow at 11 a.m. Two, government has also written to university management, suspending his earlier decision of canceling our overtime allowances. So the NLC pleaded with the association to call off the strike, but uh, this issue, it doesn't lie in my bosom. As a national chairman, and the leader of the team, I cannot get up and say that I'm going to call off the strike. I have to convene a neck meeting. And before we started the, the strike, we had a neck meeting and convene another neck meeting takes a lot of what, resources financially. So we are unable to meet this week. Hopefully we will meet next week. When neck meet, then neck will decide the next action to take, whether to respect the NLC directives or do otherwise. So at the moment, I am unable to call off the strike because I have not met my National Executive Council yet. He has also been quoted as saying that all your tier two pension deductions, one of the reasons why you were on strike, have been paid. Right, so why the continuous strike that you are on? If what he's saying is anything to go by, I mean, uh, for Swa Samoa, the executive secretary of the National Labor Commission. Not true. It is never true. I don't know where they had the information from. It's a wrong reportage, wrong information. Government is still owing us, and we are still demanding the one in arrest with the appropriate penalty, the three percentage penalty per month. That is our demand for now. So don't call that. Uh, you are expected to meet with the National Labor Commission tomorrow, February 1. Is that meeting going to take place? It, it is. You will meet them tomorrow at 11 o'clock a.m. Okay. Thank you. Isaac Donko is the national chair of the Senior Staff Association of the Universities, the public universities in Ghana, joining us. And we'll have an eye on the meeting with the National Labor Commission tomorrow. Our chief labor correspondent, Daniel Opoko, will be there. We'll be updating you on our subsequent bulletins on, at 6 a.m. and also on News Central at midday. On behalf of the rest of the team, thank you so much for connecting with us here on Ghana tonight. I am Alfred Akonsi. Do have a good night.